recording started. There your bulls back. And we're good to go. Okay, everyone, just uh, please mute yourself. Thank you for that, Garth. Uh, it's really, really lovely to be back on the air with all of you here in front. Uh, really excited to talk to you about consumer behavior today and a little bit of trends because there is so much happening at the moment. And uh, there's always the good, the bad, and the huckleberry hound. So I'm going to really just give you a little bit of spin and insight into consumer behavior in general. And then I'm going to talk to you about some of the trends that we are noticing around us at the moment. And when I'm saying around us, I'm specifically talking about our global community, our circle of excellence community, our octopus community, which is more specifically the Octo uh, uh, octopus tribe community, and what we're just generally seeing happening at the moment with uh, ambassadors and partners and everyone. So hopefully you'll jump off this call uh, today with a sense of uh, real news, if you can call it that, really what's going on on the ground, uh, what people are talking about, what people are saying, and where cons consumer behavior really is going. So for those of you on the call who don't know me, um, I think on this call, most of you do, but uh, we're recording these and really, really encouraging people uh, if the time doesn't suit whatever to, to go and, and replay this. And of course, Garth, you're always welcome to go and replay this to your groups uh, of people as well um, as you see fit. But uh, I'm Lundy Jack. Uh, I am basically the, the owner and founder of Worldwide Business Intelligence, which is represented by the octopus there, fondly referred to as Oki these days, uh, which really is our mascot there. Uh, together with Mike Hancock, my partner, We've just recently won the APEC Eco Conscious Leadership Development Award, which really means that you're dealing here with people who's passionate about change on the planet. Um, and the change I'm talking about is the change that you on this call affect in the ecosystem around you, whether that's your family, whether that's your community, whether that's your clients. Uh, it's always lovely for us to see how our influence influences them so that you can ultimately uh, be uh, of greater support to, to the entrepreneurs and the business professionals in your network. We've also uh, won the President's Award right last year. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> I can see you on this call. Um, so, uh, which is about contribution to the speakers industry. We're also uh, certified by Education Alliance Finland. Now that certification does not only speak to the, only the content that we provide, it also speaks to the way in which we teach people. So the infographics and the, the diversity and, and the cultural intelligence and the commercial intelligence that we have in there. And then of course, we're a service provider of CBD points. So enough about me, let's jump onto your consumer. Now I have the rhino there for you with his thick skin because many times what the consumer think and what's actually going on in their day-to-day -day lives is not accessible by other people. Now there's all this talk about data and big tech. So when I'm talking about consumer behavior today, I'm not talking about algorithms and I'm not talking about some computer who's tracked the behavior of your ideal client. I am talking about the way your consumer behave on a day-to-day -day basis and the way your consumer think on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm talking about the real stuff here. And I'm not talking about thousands and thousands of data on people. I'm talking about 100 people. I am maybe talking about 200 people in your vicinity and really understanding how these people behave and how they think. So with me giving this background, you can see that I'm not talking about transactional intelligence at all. Uh, I'm talking here about relational intelligence. Now, I mentioned you earlier, Garth, on this call, a person who's impeccable with networking, with relationships, with understanding what relational intelligence means. And that is what I'm going to talk about today. Getting access to the way that your consumer think and behave because of the relationships that you've built with them and not because of the big data you've collected and the algorithms you're studying. There's a massive, massive difference here. 
So I've prepared this infograph for you. Uh, well, this is the type of infographs I'm talking about. Uh, our octopus, especially old Oki, like to translate intelligence and information to people in the forms of an uh, infograph. We have quite a few of these, but as we go along, we always develop new ones that is responsive to what's going on in the market. And when you look at this uh, infographic here, I want you to take your eye there to the top of the infographic where you can see Oki, uh, the octopus in the logo. And just for a moment, stand still on the following strategic questions about your consumer. And you can even write them down or uh, if the, the shot is clear to you, you, you can take a screenshot there. Here's some of the questions you want to ask yourself about your consumer today. Does your website, social media pages and offerings speak directly to the heart of your consumer? This is a simple one. You can go after this and you can actually look at your website and look at your social media and ask yourself, look, if I was my consumer, would I sort of look at this and go, oh, it feels like Diane is speaking to me. It feels like I came here and Diane is actually speaking to me. Or do they go, uh, this is a little bit confusing, don't know what's going on here. Does your consumer have a sense of familiarity when they engage with your environment? Let's look at, doc, look at a doctor here. Imagine you go online and you Google a doctor. You want to look, for, you're looking for a doctor that is specializing in skin cancer. Now you land onto your doctor's website, but it feels like Moulin Rouge on there. You're going, this is weird. I'm looking for a skin cancer doctor. So I'm expecting a certain feel and a certain font. And I expect to be addressed like a patient. Uh, and that type of thing. But now you're on the website, it looks like a circus, it looks like Moulin Rouge, it's red and it's feathers. Immediately, you're going to lose a sense of familiarity. So that's the eyes I want to give you when you're looking at your social media and your websites and all that environment you're creating around you, your marketing collateral, your business card. Do people, let's say, for example, you target coaches, do they look at you and go, wow, I've landed in the world of coaches. If you target corporates, do they look at everything and go, wow, I've landed in the land of corporates. The third strategic question there for you, does your consumer know that you're actually speaking to them? Most of the time, the answer is no, because people don't want to niche. People don't want to call a spade a spade. They'll rather say, look, I'm into helping corporates than saying I'm into helping chief financial officers. I only work with the finance people. It's all I'm working with, right? And then last but not least, do you really know what your consumers, do you really know uh, what your consumers' thoughts and movements are? And this is on a day-to-day -day basis. So do you know where they go, what they do, what they think, and uh, that type of thing? Now, I'm not encouraging you to kickstart your uh, dome and go and spy on people or, you know, plant chips into people. <laughs> This is really all about relationships. If, if you're answering, no, I don't know these people, it's probably because you've not had exposure to them. And this is what I'm encouraging. So when you look at this infographic, and I'll jump a little bit more into detail there for you, you'll see there on the left-hand side for me uh, that your consumer has an external universe. And the external universe is represented by the actual experiences they're having on a day-to-day -day basis. And then there with the yellow on the right, they have an internal universe, which is representative of the internal dialogue that's going on in their minds on a daily basis. Now you'll note there on the internal dialogue, I did point with the arrow there to an infographic that you can access in your EdTech platform called the niche assessment. So if this is like a little bit all too much for you and you go, oh jeepers, I have not actually niched my consumer, then I would highly recommend you go and visit that assessment there and uh, let that actually guide you further. For now, we're gonna dive deeper into these external experiences that your consumer are having, as well as the internal world that they are creating for themselves. So let's start first with the, the, um, the internal dialogue. And what I've done there, I've cut it in too few um, so that you can actually see uh, a little bit more detail what's going on there. 
So let's think about the way people think and more specifically your consumer. And there's four considerations I'm going to leave you with here. And the first one there at the top is uh, with the, the, the little bit of a bottle you see there. And it's all on the left hand side. But what daily issues is occupying the mind of your consumer? What are they worried about? You know, what are they going about? Oh man, this is an issue. Uh, my software is an issue. Getting my training on software is an issue. Uh, my spouse is an issue. The fact that I'm not going out at the moment is an issue. The fact that I'm gaining weight about, uh, around my midriff. My mom says when you gain weight around your midriff, she calls it an anaconda. <laughs> So is your anaconda issue for you? Is your cholesterol the issue for you? So I'm not just talking about industry specific issues. If you, for example, tar are targeting a bunch of entrepreneurs, they may have a lot of issues that is non-business related and non-industry related. What are those issues? And what's the issues that's constantly on their mind on a daily basis? Why is this incredibly important for you? Because if you understand that universe, you can help make their life easier. That's what you want to do. You want to make their life easier. Many times people develop content or solutions that's complex. And so it adds to the complexity of the person. It doesn't necessarily make their life easier. That brings me there to the second one. What do they strongly believe in? Now, this is a very, very, very powerful one. What idealism do they strive towards? Now, Traditionally, we used to say to our clients, look, if you want to know what a person believes in, go and find out what books they read. Uh, go and uh, look at what uh, uh, political parties they follow. Go and look at the, the clubs they belong to. Uh, go and look at the communities they're part of. Go and have a look at the heated discussions they're having. Uh, go and look at the type of things that makes them really angry. Those are real good insights into the idealism of your consumer because those things are the type of things that really, really not only influence their buying behavior, but really influence what type decisions they're going to make based on what's really important to them. That's also a point of view towards their specific value system. Number three, what get them going during the day? Now, you may think what's getting them going during the day is something like a supplement they're using or the fact that they're going to the gym. But the reality is what is keeping them going during the day is their cat, Max. And I've had such interesting uh conversations and dialogue with people into trying to understand the universe of their clients and discoveries they've made where they've gone, oh my goodness, most of my clients go to the gym. I've never realized this. Oh my goodness, most of the people I draw are golfers and that really gets them going. That get, gets them motivated. Oh my goodness, I've never realized that 50% of my clients at least wear glasses. Oh my goodness, my, my uh, clients get really, really motivated by fashion. They like to do re retail therapy. Or uh, what me and Mike is finding in our environment, most of our clients, most of the audience we attract are animal lovers. They really love animals. They either have a pet or they like to travel after animals or they like pictures of animals or they really like animals. And uh, surprise, surprise, look behind me, you know. Um, you can see animals behind me. So it's not... 100% of them, but it's at least 80% of them, which is incredible insight because now you want to use animals in your marketing collateral. You want to use it in your logos. You, you want to use it as an icebreaker. You want to have presentations with animals in because people enjoy those. And then last but not least, what exactly inconvenience or worry them? Now, there's a difference between the first question there and the last one. The first one is issues like an issue can be anything that makes your life difficult. For example, you are struggling with Wi-Fi or you're struggling to find a spot where you can have good Wi-Fi or that type of thing. Whereas the inconveniences or worries can be cash flow or 
the environment or what's happening in the world or whatever the case might be. So, so it's a different, uh, a, a different thing. I call that question number four, the three A in mind. That question number four is about what wakes you up three o'clock in the morning? Not you, your consumer. Can you imagine the level of intelligence you'll have if you know what your consumers are worried about at three o'clock in the morning? Is that so that you can manipulate them or influence them or become a Dr. Evil? Not at all. That is so that you understand the heart of them so that you can develop a solution that is for them so that you can help them. You know how many people in entrepreneurship say to me, Lundy, I cannot sell. It drives me insane. I don't want to be that salesperson. I always say to them, replace the word sell with solve. That's all you have to do. Because if you understand the three o'clock mind of your consumer, you have the real ability, not the fabricated ability because you had a good idea one night, you, had the you have the real ability to affect change in people's lives, to really get them to sleep peacefully because you understand at three o'clock in the night, they're worrying about A, B, and C. So let's move on to the external universe. I want you to maybe just take two minutes or one minute or 10 seconds. Uh, I've realized I've just given you three different times there um, to just write down some, some questions you may have for me or the group at the end so that we can have a really nice discussion about it. Uh, I would rather be finished earlier and, and have us talk about this a little bit more. Uh, so do write those questions down and I'm just gonna take a sip of my coffee. I don't normally drink coffee these days, but uh, this morning I thought about a coffee. Right, so now we're going uh, to the, the external environment here. Now we're looking at uh, things like there at the top. What are they reading and listening to, right? Look at the eyes. What do they put in front of the eyes? So trace their steps every morning. Say to yourself, okay, this is interesting my ideal consumer let's let's look at how they behave do they get up in the morning and click on the tv and watch the news do they sit at the breakfast table and read the paper do they go into the bathroom and put their makeup on and listen to youtube videos on a topic do they read a book or maybe they um, have religious material they consume before they start their day do they go to the gym, put the podcast into their ear? Do they uh, listen to music? Do they have complete silence? Are they listening to nature? Really, really important cons uh, considerations, not only in terms of understanding your consumer and their problems, but also understanding the way in which you're gonna give them material to consume. I mean, if your group is on the treadmill every morning with a podcast in their ear, but you developing for them a Hollywood movie, you sort of gonna miss each other. Uh, or if they, uh, every morning, uh, you know, in the age group where they still enjoy a proper crisp uh, newspaper and a coffee, but you doing freaking Mr. and Mrs. High Tech podcast, they just gonna go, good on you, but doesn't work for me, right? I want my paper. So have to understand that audience. You have to understand what gives them joy. And I think this is where people miss it. They read the environment and the trends, and then they could give the consumer something based on the environment and the trends, but they're completely oblivious of the world or the bubble that that consumer has created for themselves on a daily basis. The next one is there, who are they talking to? Who are they taking advice from? Strange thing, but I had actually, uh, you know, when, when we started uh, our circle of excellence, we had a lot of people uh, saying, look, uh, before they want to move ahead with us, they want to check in with their spouse. And over the last year, that has changed quite significantly. People are now checking in with their parents, uh, whether they should go ahead. Isn't that fascinating? And I'm not talking about an age group here of 20, uh, 30, 40 year olds. I'm talking here of an age group of 50 year olds and, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to have your, your parents still around in your 60s, but people really checking in with relatives, whether they should move ahead with a program, whatever, as opposed to checking in with a, 
uh, a colleague or someone at a net network or a peer. So they're now checking in with family. Um, is it because of COVID? Is it because people are now in close vicinity to each other? Is it because they don't network anymore, but would rather go to a daughter or a nephew or uh, someone in the house saying, look, I'm buying into this. What do you think? What do you think my tribe, you know, type of thing. So that's very, very interesting. But who are they talking to? And more importantly, who are they taking counsel from? You know, are they taking counsel from their pets? Are they looking at their dog and going, what do you think? Do you think I should do this? Are they taking counsel from their children? Uh, so many people, uh, especially in the cereal and porridge industries, uh, know that the parent will not choose the porridge or the cereal. It will be chosen by the child. So the child walk down in the aisle and go, I want the pink strawberry pops or I want this one or I want that one, whatever. And you, you don't stand a chance in hell. You're not going to make that decision. The child is going to make you taking counsel from the child. So that is the essence and the heart of consumer behavior, knowing who counsels your client. For example, in corporates, a lot of people don't get that it's the executive assistant that counsels the CEO on what he and she should do or not. Many people don't realize that many times uh, these corporates, especially the CEO, has a lead consultant with whom, whom they've had a relationship for years. And if you don't get past that person, you'll never get in. Um, many people don't realize that a CEO is scared to death of the CFO, the numbers guy or, or his auditor. And if you don't incorporate those people in your advertising and your marketing collateral and your conversation, you're just not going to be able to reach that person. So who are they talking to? Uh, who is counseling them and who do they trust and who's giving them advice? That brings us to the third one there. What is their daily habits and routine? Simple question, but incredibly powerful. Where do they go? What do they do? Are these people who are sitting in traffic swearing all the time? Are you working with people that hang out in coffee shops? Are you working with a crowd that loves luxury and sit around in hotels? Are you busy dealing with people who's hanging out in the gym all the time and pumping muscles? Are you dealing with people who's part of some prestigious clubs and hang around there and, and that's what they do? Uh, are you dealing with people who's in uh, um, uh, libraries? We have to ask ourselves these questions. What do they do on a day-to-day -day basis? Because that's where you get them. That's where you associate with them. And that's how you pull some of that into your brand for a sense of familiarity. Um, one of the stories me and Mike both like to tell is uh, one of our clients in, in KL, we discovered that uh, her main audience are people who drive Mercedes Benz. And having that knowledge actually allowed us to build the colors of Mercedes Benz into a brand to create a sense of familiarity for our audience, but also safety and security. Remember with this crazy online ecosystem that's happening at the moment, people don't trust. And it's really tough for them to trust. It's tough for us to trust. You know, you look at stuff and you go, mm, is this real? Uh, are they trying to entice me? Is this a bit of a, you know, what's going on here? Maybe I should get a reference. Maybe I should ask someone. So the more you create that level of familiarity, for your consumer and therefore giving them the message that, look, I do get you, uh, the more you will actually be able to, in a positive way, influence buyer behavior, AKA sales. That brings me to the fourth question there. What exactly are they consuming? Are they drinking Coca-Cola? Are they drinking freshly squeezed fruit juices that's paraben free? Are they drinking wine? Are they eating hamburgers? Are they McDonald's haters? Are they uh, fine dining uh, people who love that type of experience? Do they enjoy Asian food? What do they consume? And, and here you might almost wanna go and look at uh, the groceries that these type of people in your target market buy and you'll be blown away. I love standing in line at the grocer and spying on what's in people's trolley. I find it fascinating um, to look, and then I try in my mind to create a, a, a consumer story. Is this person healthy? Are they trying to alkaline themselves? 
and are they a person who likes to entertain? Is there children in the house? Uh, do they like color? Are they a budget type of aware person? And this is a real nice game that you can play if you want to start getting the heart of consumer behavior. So just one step back in summary, your external issues, and you can, again, you can take a photo of this if it's going to be helpful for you. Your external issues would really be in summary, what are people reading, listening to, who are they talking to, what's their daily habits, what routines are they following, and what exactly are they consuming? You can always use this as a checklist or you can use it as an assessment uh, to help you actually do a little bit of self-study afterwards and come up with a, a bit more of a real profile of this consumer. I think we've been so indoctrinated with the niche concept that it causes us many times to sit and do a workshop on your niche and who you want them to be, as opposed to going and analyzing the behavior of your consumer, which can be two completely different things. The next one there is the internal universe. There you look at the daily issues they're experiencing, the beliefs that they hold dear in their hearts, certain ideology that they're following, values, what gets them going, what really inspires them, and what do they really worry about. So there's your infographic. Uh, here's a good opportunity for you again to take a picture if you want to. Uh, if you want to actually uh, look and study uh, more into this infographic a little bit later. So this brings me to some of the trends for 2021. This is consumer behavioral trends uh, that we have noticed in, in our environment. Uh, this year or in last year specifically. So it's the sum total of those two. Um, and I just want to say that those birds you're seeing there, it's just such a good, it's just such a good visual and analogy of what this is. You know, you have a, you have a flock, you have a flock of birds and, and they tend to all look in a certain direction, whether that direct direction is this is what I want the world to look like. This is what I want my family structure to look like. This is what I, this is the experiences I want to have. This is what I want to uh, put into my mouth uh, from a taste perspective. This is what I want to see. This is what I want to feel. This is what I want to experience. So you understanding the behavior of your consumer would be you, you allowing yourself to get insight into what's important for your flock and how your flock behaves. So one of the trends uh, they, that we clearly seeing emerging is uh, people are looking local. Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be funny, but it's not like they can really go global. Of course, of course, people are, um, you know, people are doing the global thing online and they're doing all that. I mean, in a large extent, uh, we are doing that, you know, um, remaining international and remaining global. But I mean, it's, you know, we've not really been traveling a lot. Uh, we're probably planning to do more of that again in 2022 um, onwards, 2023 or whatever. But uh, there's a real sense of patriotism emerging towards people. And it makes total sense because if you see your local community suffering, you want to contribute. If you see the guy down the streets uh, shop closing down, you want to contribute. If you see the farmers in your country suffering, uh, you want to support their organic produce. If you see um you know a restaurants closing down you want to sort of rally people up and go and support your local restaurants so that they don't go out of business you know uh, me and mike are suddenly starting to eat so many breakfasts because we're trying to support these different places because a lot of them have swung from dinner to breakfast so we're eating all these breakfasts but uh, it's a, a a support of local community mentality so there's huge business opportunity there in terms of consumer behavior doesn't mean you have to completely change your business module but uh, if you've been pondering about your uh, deep-seated secret hateful technology uh, it's not such a bad thing you may be much more on the right track <laughs> you realize there's a lot of people going look i'm going to contribute locally um, I'm going to canalize people locally and I'm going to do that until I know what's going to happen again. Uh, can't travel internationally, can't contribute to other countries except for online. So I'm actually going to go offline and contribute local. Now, you may not want to do local, but you want to maybe do more offline or maybe you want to do more offline and not so much local. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter as long as you uh, 
uh, aware that there's quite a strong trend developing with people going, no tech, no nothing. I just want to do something local. I want to contribute. Look at all these uh, animals sticking together locally on the picture. Uh, then also exciting one, uh, really brand new supply chains developing. Uh, boy, oh boy, let me tell you, when it comes to uh, tough times and the world cha changing, people get super creative. Uh, me and Mike's been incredibly inspired by people's creativity and how they view their supply chain. And they're looking different at who's going to supply me with what and how am I going to deliver to the client and a, a very, very obvious way in which you can see this happening is when you go to your local supermarket, you'll suddenly see the magical appearance of products on the shelf that never was there before. And you go, huh, that's strange. Um, last week I was looking for this product. Now suddenly it's that product. And now that product is gone. And now this, it's because of supply change uh, and how that's changing. You know, you, you maybe were a very fat and happy supermarket and, you know, you forced your suppliers with price sensitivity because you want to make the most profit and now suddenly some of these supermarkets are going oops there's no one to supply me with products and services so i'll have to support you and i'll have to bring you into my supply chain so uh, that's really interesting and then this also is leading to really interesting collaborations uh, that's a trend or a wave that me and mike has been riding in the past few months going hey here's a nice pot of honey why eat it alone why not share It's always interesting when the screen freezes, when nobody says anything, and everybody's waiting for somebody to say something. <laughs> it's yours. I'll carry on, Dive. Finish the lesson. Come on, Bruce. I think you can help out here. Yeah, hey? <laughs> <laughs> the, the first thing I always check, Dai, is can I see movement on other people's screens? Because the moment you know that, then you know it's not you. Absolutely. I was just waiting for somebody to blink then when Landy froze. But it's also, all, it's also always interesting, the photo that gets shown of the frozen moment, isn't it? Hey, it's always yeah. that one where you've got some strange thing happening to your face. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mm. Nicola, any ideas what's going on? I'm still waiting to hear from her as she's okay. back. Here we go. Probably sitting talking to herself and <laughs> <laughs> you unmute now, Landy. I'm back, everyone. Everything just stopped. They literally just stopped. So I'm just gonna continue with the recording. And uh, then we'll go on. I don't even have an explanation for this, it just stopped. Okay, so I'm just going to go back. Uh, it is to... recorded anyway, because it, it continued. You can watch yourself freeze later. <laughs> <laughs> I look a little bit freezing again, to be honest. I'm just looking for the keynote, because that somehow disappeared as well. It's Murphy's so, Law. It is our friend Murphy. Okay, so we should be back here now. I'm just waiting for the keynote to be an option for me. Just one second. Where's my bull? There's my bull. Can you see my bull? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. And we are back in business. Okay. So collaborations. I'm not sure exactly where I cut off, but go and look at are you the person who's developing the product and service and supplying the product and service and following the product and service and upselling on the product and service? Or can you start to incorporate people in your entire supply chain, therefore working with the principle of one plus one equals 11? Another trend we're picking up on here is family business. Just look at that birdie. And uh, then it's nest. I mean, people has been literally forced to live together, work together, laugh together, cry together, eat together, do everything together. And uh, I cannot tell you how many times I'm hearing this now. Oh, my daughter is now doing my social media. Oh, my husband has decided to come on board and work with me on this. Oh, this one is doing this. Oh, my family is doing this. And families are really starting to stick together. Um, I'm personally very interested in seeing how long this trend is gonna, gonna ride out. Uh, because the opposite is happening as, is happening as well. Uh, people saying, look, I love my wife, but I can't work with her anymore. Or you know what, I really, really, my husband's a cool dude, but uh, need my own space, need to get out of here, uh, need my own office. So a lot of people has been uh, promoting that the, the era of the office is over. Uh, me and Mike don't necessarily see that. A lot of people want to get out of the house. Uh, a lot of people go and need their uh, personal space now, their golden hour. I think the way that these offices is going to structure is going to be slightly different. Um, we do seeing the comeback of these co-working spaces or more flexible ways of actually having an office. Uh, we personally have clients who's literally bought the house next door and turned that into an office. So there is many things. So this is a bit of an extreme here. You have on the one side, the family businesses, people who want to work together, who's done it during 2020 and is doing it this year and it's going, wow, it's really, really working well. There's sort of a family crest mentality, you know, we're all going to do this family thing, we're going to do it for the family and we're going to have a purpose together as a family. And then there's the group also that's going to love my family, lots of love, love lots of peace, but I'm out of here, I need an office, I need my golden hours, I can't concentrate. So uh, both of those things happening. Now, that is it from my side for consumer behavior. I'm going to take you now back to the infographic so that we can speak to that. And um, I'm going to ask you to, to uh, unmute yourself uh, if there's anything you want to share or any question you want to ask. I'll just sit and smile at you until someone has a question. So only mine's not as less a question and more a kind of observation or realization as you were going through the slides is in this digital age when so many people have got social media accounts from Facebook to Instagram to you know whatever else and they're and they're posting anybody in sales um, can go and look at not only the LinkedIn which is the formal work experience but what their their personal preferences are so the, the point that you were referring to is what are they doing what are they like what are they dislike is a lot of it is, is, is available. So it makes it quite interesting in doing research for a target customer, how much information can be gleaned in advance yeah. of engaging with them and starting to do your kind of early pitching. Well, there's great insight from Robert. Thank you so much, Robert, because you can literally head over to the LinkedIn profile and scroll down. You can literally do that. Some people put that on their, their Facebook as well, right, Robert? where they actually put, but I mean, you can just go and look at a person's Facebook. You'll go easily, oh, this person is nuts about animals. I mean, it's not like I'm very subtle about what I like on my Facebook. Um, you know, you can see I like animals and you can see, so, you know, some people are, you know, they don't mind sharing that stuff. So it would be super interesting if you take your top 100 clients and you put them in an Excel sheet and you start jotting out their preferences as a study you just take a nice day to do this and you see if you can actually pick up on a trend. Maybe you see something on their relationship status. Maybe you notice that all the clients you work with has as their relationship status, it's complicated. <laughs> 
or maybe you realize that all your clients have on LinkedIn, you know, a, a specific group that they belong to or whatever. It would be super interesting. You know, many people don't even realize that they have a majority male or female audience. Because I've never done that study, you know, you don't, and, and I think this, uh, this whole tech algorithm um, wave, if you may call it that, is really getting people to, you know, think in the thousands of numbers, and that sometimes can be really overwhelming. You always only need 100. The only kickstart you ever need for researching consumer behavior, starting a sales process is 100 names and surnames and then go and research them. So if you research 100 people, you have an Excel sheet, you jot down there each to every name, what preferences did I find on their LinkedIn profile? What did I find on their Facebook? What did I find on their website maybe? Um, you can look at some of the pictures and things. Then uh, a beautiful, beautiful uh, picture will emerge uh, after you've done that for 100 people. Who's next? Landy, I, I have a question. Assessment on the bottom corner of the, I can't quite read that, but um, have you got a larger slide of that? Uh, Ken Jackson speaking, right? Absolutely, I have this in a, uh, I have this in an image format as well as a PDF. What we will do, we will post this on your Octopus Tribe so that you can access the image but so that you can also download it in a PDF format, which will help you to print it. Will that be useful? Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Sure. Uh, yeah. We'll do that. You know, sometimes I like the image format of these infographics because uh, I always encourage people to open a folder on their phone um, and save the infographics in there so that you can actually access it quickly and scroll through it. But the PDF versions is always great uh, for print. Some people still enjoy a good print and then workshop around that. Uh, I'm one of those people. I think Sarah, you're next. I had a question, it's Sarah speaking. So I found in the world of online, in particular the modular way in which websites are being designed, I found it a huge battle to try and present to my client an image via my website that is unique and personal um, and I've recently been trying to upgrade I'm looking at Kajabi and all the sort of bigger packages and I you cannot make yourself anything other than look like a slick corporate so I have spent a huge amount of time trying to make my website look amateurish and my consumers believe that I'm talking to them directly um, and you know the, the push is to not is to become big slick um, and there's almost no packages that cater for a personalized, unique shop front in a way. What's your question around that, Sarah? Well, I mean, is it do you, is one then judged if you keep going with a, a, a more personal site as not being global, international? I mean, is there any um, drawback against keeping it smaller and more intimate than moving onto these bigger systems? I think, Sarah, thank you for that question, because it actually speaks to the heart of what we're discussing here today. It really depends on your audience. You know, if your audience is premium and corporate, uh, they're going to compare your brand with premium and corporate. Uh, if your audience, uh, you know, many of the corporates are spoiled for choice when it comes to uh, brands and the type of collateral that gets presented to them. You know, there's now corporates who uh, get iPads delivered personally to them with collateral on there, you know, with moving ads and, you know, interactive websites, or whatever. So it really depends on your audience. If your audience is an intimate, personalized group of people who want that feel, then you do have the opportunity and the advantage to keep your brand like that. But it really depends on who you speak to. I mean, the conversation that I am going to have online, let's say I'm building a shop front or I'm building a website. If I want to speak to a corporate or I want to speak to a coach, or I want to speak to an entrepreneur, or I want to speak to an author, I'm speaking to completely, completely different audiences. Now, some people have found the chat that you overcome the challenge in combining their audience into very specific niches that brings those things together. If you can do that, you're really, really onto something. But uh, 
Never, never worry about what other consumers think. So we are taught never worry about what other people think. Never worry about what other consumers think. You are only interested in what your consumers think. And again, a list of 100 people analyzing what type of people there are. Do they dress more arty farty? Are they more an author type of person? Are they more an organic, holistic, simplistic type of person versus, you know what, I'm going to target the celebrity market. I need the sparkles and uh, the lips and the heels and the, you know, who are. And if, if, if you're not aware of who, who your consumers are and you're not building something that is a conversation for them, they compare you with other people who does and, and you get lost. You get lost in the, in the process. And by the way, that's a nice thing because it takes off the hook. It makes you realize that you may be comparing apples with pears. You may be comparing yourself with your competitor, but it's not your competitor at all. You have completely different target markets. Your target markets is your audience, whereas their target market is a different audience. And that's the type of things, you know, you don't want to compare uh, uh, yourself with another company. You want to compare your audience with their audience. That's what you want to do. Well, Andy, I had an experience uh, way back in before the digital age. I was a retailer in footwear, and often we had a uh, group come wow. in. So there was grandma and ma and a young girl come in, and it was buying footwear for the young girl. And it was uh, really interesting to pick up who the main influencer in the purchase was. So the young girl might say, no, I don't like those. I don't like that color or whatever. And mum would say, oh, no, we're not spending that much. And grandma would say, whatever's best for you, darling. And uh, the main <laughs> influencer, the, the main person who made the decision was often grandma. Well, what incredible intelligence, Garth. I mean, there you go. You can't ask for a more classic example. Now, this, thank you for that, Garth, because this brings me back to Sarah's question. Sarah, you may be spending millions of dollars developing a front shop and website for Ma, but you should be developing one for Grandma. That's the point. That's the point. So, and that's why the behavior of our consumer and the influencer especially is so important. And Garth, I've had firsthand experience what you've just explained in my own family structure, like no one beats Grandma, right? That's the final say. <laughs> Any more questions here for me? Or anyone who wants to make a statement? We still have some time, so you're very welcome to contribute. Hello, hello, Landy. Hello. Hi, Colin. Hello, Landy. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, yes, just clearly. following on some of, the observa some of the observations that Robert made and uh, with regard to the intelligence and how you would get it when we look at these eight uh, topics on your infographic. Uh, the external ones, I think, are a little easier for you to, to glean the information. Obviously, looking at LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram and those sort of things. But what I'm struggling with is uh, um, the first one on, on the internal dialogue. What daily issues occupy their mind? Practically, how would you find that out? Colin, I'll ask them. So a, a way I would go about doing it is really getting into, uh, let's call it a, a word I came across this week, which I really enjoyed, radical. I'll go in radical conversation with people. And so that means that you have 100 people in your target market and you are conversing with them on a daily basis. And you, you, know, you can start with one call a day, or you can have two Zoom calls a day if you're in lockdown. If you're not in lockdown, I, I couldn't recommend more that you close your laptop and you go out there and you have coffees with people and people in your target market and you don't initially sell them anything. You sit them down and uh, you get up in the morning with a big jump uh, of happiness and joy in your heart and you go, I'm not selling anyone at the moment. I'm literally conversing with people for the next month. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to talk to people. I'm going to have so many coffees. 
that um, I'm going to be a hyperactive, but I'm going to enjoy every moment and I'm going to chat with people. And when they sit down, I'm going to start uh, with the pump, drop, pump model. I love the pump, drop, pump model. Um, pump, drop, pump is a, a, a type of a way of communicating with people, especially if the uh, intention with communication is to extract information out of them. And that's what you really want to do here. So you're going to pump, drop, pump them, Colin. You're going to sit and you're going to take them for a coffee and you're going to start with pump. And pump is you're really going to build them up. Look, look but it has to be sincere. You're going to say to them, look, uh, I, I, uh, I've taken the liberty of going through some of your social media and some of your Facebook pages. And I've noticed that you are a canoe person, that you're constantly canoeing. Tell me about your canoeing. Do you know how few people I know is canoeing? Do you know how absolute admiration I have for canoe people? Because, you know, I'll do two canoes, canoes, and then I'll drown. Uh, you know, friends of me and Mike put us into a canoe on the water one day. <laughs> when we were in the canoe, we sat down. And we're like, how did we allow this even to happen? Because we're not even canoe people. <laughs> and then we had to do the canoe thing. Well, you can start the conversation like that. I see you're into canoeing. You pump that person up. You make them feel good. Then you drop. Then you go. Look, I'm really looking at increasing um, my contribution to society and my target market. I don't want to create something mediocre. I want to create something incredible. And uh, I invited you today. Um, hopefully, you'll trust me enough to tell me what daily issues occupy your mind. Tell me. Tell me about it. Then they're going to go, blah, blah, blah. They're not going to tell you the truth. Then you ask them the second time. Uh, they're going to go, blah, 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 waffle, waffle, waffle. Then you're going to go, yeah, I hear what you're saying. But tell me what really occupy your mind on a daily basis. What, what's your real issues? Now you're going to get a step deeper. Uh, come on, Colin. You've seen how the Russians does it. Uh, interrogation, interrogation. And then by the third step, <laughs> by the third time, you're going to go again. Uh, look, yeah, I heard what you said in the beginning. And this middle part makes sense. But, but come on. You know, this is the part where you lean forward. This is the part where you go, Tell me what issues occupy your mind. And, and they'll tell you. Uh, the third time, they'll tell you. They won't tell you the, the first time. Why? Because that's how people are. Because you have to give them time and space to trust you. You're the same. And then now you've dropped them. Now you're going to pump them again. So remember, pump, drop, pump. So you've pumped them. You've dropped them. You had the serious conversation. But you don't want to leave the person in serious conversation. Otherwise, they're going to think you're too serious and boring. So you have to leave them by pumping them up again and saying, you know what, uh, uh, and I'm just giving examples. You have to be sincere, yeah. Uh, you know what, it was absolutely fantastic for me to meet with you today. Um, it, it's just not a lot of people who show up for these things at the moment. And I just think you're such a stand-up guy or stand-up girl and uh, really, really grateful to have you in my life. And shake hands and there you go. And you feel good. You didn't sell anyone anything. You didn't force yourself on anyone. You just go, wow. And you know what, Colin, the beauty of this pump up pump exercise to understand the, the behavior of the consumer is you're going to find yourself actually building very deep and meaningful relationships with people and some strong friendships as well. Thanks, Landy. Very good. Very welcome. Very welcome. We have chance for, let's say, another question of two. Anyone who wants to, you're welcome. Oh, I've, I've got something I just want to share, Landy, just something that we do um, for all our clients. We have an initial kind of session where we call um, creating the future focused framework. Um, I think Ian calls it the architect sister, uh, you know, thing. And what you're doing is we, we kind of building a map with our client with a roadmap. But what we've learned is to throw in a whole bunch of other questions to kind of grow that love and trust right up front. So we ask them about all the other aspects of life. So we chat about relationships and hobbies and holidays and their faith and, you know, where their children are going to be in three years time. And even though it's good to build that relationship, it gives us huge insight into the mindset of where our clients are as well. So we take a majority of that to build customized program roadmap for them. But we also gleaning huge amount of wisdom out of that by looking at 
at different habits and that. And we definitely have changed our target market kind of marketing for the needs of people that we don't even express normally through what we normally serve because we, we kind of opening them up and peeling back those layers quite hard right in that first session. And that allows us to glean that kind of wisdom um, from them in a, in a kind of clever relational kind of way. That's stunning. Bruce, I love it. You know, uh, you're actually very much in power with a, a big, big corporate trend at the moment where they're completely revamping the induction process and aligning it to what you've just communicated here, where, you know, many uh, human capital departments and corporates are now taking a very standardized induction process and changing it to, okay, Bruce, sit down and tell me what's your career aspirations. Sit down and tell me what house you and your wife want to buy. Sit down and tell me uh, what is the education that you want your child to have one day. Sit down and tell me whether you want to be location specific or whether you want to hold work from home and, um, and hold from an office. Tell me about you, Bruce. And so that is very, very, very much in, in, in par and in line with um, what a lot of corporates are doing at the moment. And I just love it because transactional, and this is the this is probably the statement I want to leave you with here today. Transactional will never win over relational. Ever. Will never win. So your absolute competitive advantage is your ability to have deep, meaningful relationships with people. Um, you know, Bruce, if I'm in your environment and you ask me, uh, you know, about my aspirations and future and loves and loaves, why would I want to go to a bigger competitor who's not going to give me that personal information mm. and make me feel loved? So never ever feel that you are truly in competition with big corporates or big institutions uh, in which you feel you can't reach the level because your relationships that you're having with people are gold. So um, I'm going to ask Nicola uh, to, to put the image up for us on the octopus tribe of this infographic. This is brand new material. You won't find it in, in octopus in any of the nine modules. It's brand new. And then um, I'm also going to ask Nicola to put the, the PDF document up there as well uh, with that. And uh, just quickly want to scroll you and see if there's any questions that came on the chat box. Philippe said some CEOs and entrepreneurs have next to zero online presence. How true is that? Uh, basically just makes it more useful to meet them in uh, hotels and uh, or have small boutique events or meet them at breakfast meetings where you can have personal conversations. Paul said, thanks, Landy, and all. See you soon leaving for another meeting. Bye, Paul. Heather, yep, I am drinking decaf. Otherwise, you won't be able to, uh, to cope with me. Sarah wants to ask about clients moving on offline, which I'm noticing what are people using to connect or create community if a global audience? I try WA, but I'm not, but not everyone likes that. What's WA, Sarah? Oh, WhatsApp. <laughs> uh, Sarah, I'm a big WhatsApp fan. I'm a really, really big WhatsApp fan. I'm actually a fan of two major things. I'm a fan of getting in my car and leaving my house and meeting people person face-to-face uh, -face, and I'm a fan of WhatsApp. That, that, those two tools combined is probably one of the most powerful. Me and Mike are actually, uh, now that we're not traveling, getting more international and more global. And those are uh, some of the main tools we're using. Uh, meeting, collaborating with people who's even more global uh, by meeting them in person and using WhatsApp. And then uh, just thanks, Landy, lots of gold nuggets as usual. Uh, Colin, love what you might are doing. Thank you, Colin. We love you too. And uh, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of the morning, rest of the evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Landy.